Good afternoon. Good morning uh, from, from Sydney, Australia. Uh, my name is James Collins. I'm a senior lecturer here in the Department of Classics and Ancient History. And uh, this is one of my colleagues, uh, Marguerite Heary. Lovely to be with you today. Uh, I just better let you know a little bit about myself and why we're talking about Hippocrates. I'm a retired physician and uh, I've uh, found myself in my retirement to being interested in ancient things. And of course, one of these is Hippocrates, who is called the father of medicine. And I'm now doing a thesis, which James is supervising, uh, on Hippocrates and his, his legacy to us today. So that is how we come to be talking about Hippo Hippocratic innovations and the art of living. And I'm going to take the first part of this and talk to you about what I think some of Hippocrates' innovations were. First of all, I have to say they weren't his particular innovations. They were from the Hippocratic, Hippocratic Corpus, uh, which is a group of about 60 treaties that were written over a period of about 100 years, all with different authors, and they encapsulate the ideas that these physicians had and developed from the middle of the fifth century BC. So having said that, what are the Hippocratic innovations that I would like to talk to you about today? First of all, the examination of the body, that is the elicitation of physical science. Secondly, the recording of a medical history, in particular, a history of the present illness. And thirdly, the establishment of a database, a database that will uh, record disease progression and outcome. So to the first of these innovations, physical examination. Physical examination of a patient's body wasn't a new thing in the 5th century BC. Babylonian clay tablets from the 11th century BC recorded physical examination nation from head to toe and from ancient Egypt we have the Edwin Smith papyrus. This papyrus was a 1700 BC copy of an earlier one 2600 BC and there was a systematic physical examination recorded for each of the patients as it described. So people were doing physical examination of the body but the exhortations to examine the body that are found throughout the corpus, the Hippocratic corpus, were actually the first written direction for physical examination that were available to Western medicine. So that makes them very important. One of the clearest is in the treatise Prognostic, which is written towards the end of the fifth century BC. It's a specialist manual highly regarded by ancient scholars, which discusses the interpretation of physical science. What is of great interest to us today is the chapters two to nine that you see at the top of your handout. These detail precisely the proper examination of the patient, first with presenting signs, such as general appearance and posture, then to specific examination of the head, hands and abdomen in the process describing the significance of the particular signs of its disease and its outcome. This text carefully describes physical examination and then palpation, but there is no percussion or auscultation, which we do today. These aspects of physical examination had to wait for a neck. The importance of physical examination is made clear in Proretics 2.2, when the author says, I record the clinical signs from which one must advise who will become well, which will die. The Hippocratic doctors had no idea of pathophysiology and their reputations depended on giving a correct prognosis of knowing who would survive and who would not. So physical signs, particularly, particularly those ones associated with death, were very important too. This 
physical examination placed medicine at the border of the seen and the unseen. A sign on the body surface, like a swelling, tenderness or rigidity, were indications of some process going on underneath, of some disease process that was occurring within the body. And so palpation, the physical examination of pace, was an early part of the discovery of body function. It was not only discovery though, the Hippocratics regarded palpation as in an important way of reducing mistakes. In Proretic 2, it says, by using your hands to palpate the abdomen and vessel, you are less likely to make a mistake than you, if you not, do not do this. And we know, don't we, that that's really very true today as it was two and a half thousand years ago. If you don't examine the patient, you don't find out what's wrong with them. It's important too to consider what the significance of the very physical act of palpation on the body to the patient meant. In earlier societies, symptoms of disease were believed to be sent and controlled by some supernatural force, some cosmic influence that was outside of the body and the priest king used his divine hands to effect a cure. This laying on of hands was performed by many ancient societies and priests, kings and shamans and witch doctors were all involved. When the Hippocratic physician laid his hand on his patient though, he was not magic or a divine cure. He was looking for a material fact. Is there a lump? Is it tender? The hands of the healer remained important but their purpose was changed. The physician's hands did not bring the magical, they were searching for information. The act of palpation had changed from divine intervention to establishing facts. I think a very significant innovation. The second innovation of the Hippocrates was their written recording of the medical history. As far as I'm aware, this was not something that had been done in earlier Mesopotamian or Egyptian medical cultures, but it was an important part of normal Hippocratic practice. It was not only closely associated with physical examination, but was really part of the third innovation, which was the establishment of a database of disease progression and outcome. Affections 37 details how to take a history, advising that the patient should be questioned about what were his symptoms, what had happened beforehand, how long the symptoms had been present, his recent bowel function and his regimen, that is what he was eating and drinking and so on. The appendix to regimen in acute disease advises the physician to, in inverted commas, Mark well the first day of illness and question the patient, goes in with commas. The treaties Epidemics 1 and Epidemics 3 are both examples of what we would today call patient histories. These are very detailed accounts of patients that record the names and occupations, this is where they became ill, symptoms and signs of the initial uh, onset, then the disease progress and finally the outcome. They describe the daily state of the patient, any change in symptoms and signs, and may cover periods of weeks or even months. This was the first time in the history of medicine that case studies on a daily basis had been recorded. So it was really a very significant innovation. So we have covered First innovation being physical examination. Second innovation being written, uh, taking a patient's history. What about the third innovation? The development of a medical database. The physicians working with patient records and facts in Epidemics 1 and Epidemics 3 were aiming to detail and define the natural history of disease. With no real knowledge of pathophysiology, 
pathology. They could not make a diagnosis of any sort of specific disease at all. They had no idea. And the prediction of the outcome for the patient was the goal that they set themselves. It was the goal of the good physician. They wanted facts and figures to help them understand the different syndromes they were seeing and to predict their outcomes. This database could help them to develop their skill of prognosis. The physician needed to have written works available to help him, described by one author as, the power to, to study what is written, I consider an important part of medicine. They actually needed to have previous notes, previous histories, so that they could get some idea of whether this thing that they were seeing at the present time was what someone else had seen in the past. The physician uh, then, with this knowledge in the art, uh, another text in the art says, the physician having considered the case and past cases of like characteristics, so as to say how they were treated or cured. He needed to be able to see what was going on so that he could practice the best form of medicine possible. He was using accumulated data and comparing it with what he saw in the patient who was sitting in front of him. He will take a history, do a physical examination, then make an informed and logical decision about what has to be done. What, a, what is of very high importance is the ability to decide if the patient will actually survive disease. This is brought out particularly in Epidemics 1 and Epidemics 3. There are 42 case histories which result in 25 deaths. And it was also known that acute disease was the most, most lethal. And again, it was known that it was possible, knowing what was written, to foretell death. So you will note, as we terminal ones. This reflects a couple of basic reflects a couple of basic facts about the society of the fifth century BC. Life expectancy then was presumed to be between 30 and 40 years. So the likelihood of acute infections and trauma uh, causing death was very, very high. And the cases that are described in the corpus are generally all at the end stage of disease. Certainly, in the corpus, there are many references to levels of suppurative disease and abscess formation that you will certainly never see in your medical careers, unless, of course, you work for a third world country. Death was ever present in the fifth century Greece and in all ancient societies. The physician needed to be able to recognize the symptoms and signs of impending death. If he predicted a good or bad outcome and the patient died, he would not be blamed. Whereas if he predicted a good outcome, and the patient died, he would be regarded as being incompetent, his reputation impaired, or even totally ruined. So, what can we say about these physicians of fifth century Greece? Were they the innovators of our title? Looking back on their aims and ideals, the aims and ideals recorded in the Hippocratic Corpus, looking at them from our present, we can say that these ancient Greeks certainly were innovators and I believe were innovators of the highest order. In the treatise Ancient Medicine, the author asserts that over the earlier centuries, medicine had made many excellent discoveries. And it was now in the fifth century able to produce a method and a principle to continue research. These men wanted to give their patients the best treatment, to investigate their symptoms, to examine their bodies, to research into the cause of disease and find a treatment. Their 
systems on recording the history and performing a systematic physical examination and building up a database to enable prognosis was actually a new rational and scientific approach to the body, both in health and in disease. This attitude was quite different from earlier times and different from the medical practice of other civilizations at the same period. The accumulation of data for analysis and interpretation is a scientific activity. The interpretation of the data is the essential process of scientific reason. So to sum up finally, the Hippocrates, they examined, recorded and interpreted physical science. They collected data and interpreted. They took the practice of medicine into a scientific art. They were true innovators. And now to tell you about how they behave in relation to our living, Dr. Collins will talk. Thank you, Marguerite. That was uh, excellent. And uh, I, I will, um, I'll be building on what Marguerite's um, given us today. I'm taking it in a slight, slightly different direction, which uh, she and I, uh, she and I uh, 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 debate uh, uh, regularly. So we're happy to continue that debate. You'll see this is a very different direction, but it comes back to many of the things that, that Marguerite um, gave us. So let's now turn to innovations in Hippocratic practice concerning the wellness, not of the patient, which was always the primary concern, but of the physician himself. Before we start, it's important to note what wellness as a concept or condition with regards to the physician might mean in the context of the Hippocratic course. For the patient, wellness must mean in the ancient Hippocratic context, physical and even mental health, which is a return to a normal, natural state. The mental health of the patient, as we shall see, often affects his physical. But the Hippocratics do not appear concerned with the physical health of the physician himself. In fact, it appears in some instances that the Hippocratic physician might have knowingly put himself in harm's way. For instance, he gathered that the environment, specifically the air, surrounding those with epidemic diseases contains the cause of illness. In these cases, the primary directive was to take care uh, that the patient, quote, inspire as little as possible and from a source as far, as, as far removed as possible and thus be removed from the contaminated area. Indeed, the only reason the physician should abandon his ward was not for fear of proximity to the source of illness, but to avoid both the futility of trying to treat incurable patients and the ridicule of more skilled physicians who know better than to waste their time and talents on desperate cases. So we see that wellness with regards to the phys physician in this way has nothing to do with his own physical health, but something to do with his understanding the limits of his craft and his reputation. Before we develop these aspects of the physician's wellness, it will be helpful to turn to a broader discourse of well-being that emerges in the Mediterranean at the same time that Hippocrates and his colleagues are investigating the symptoms and natural causes of disease. Contemporary intellectuals like Democritus of Abdera and Socrates of Athens, the famous Socrates, uh, too are interested in health, but not health body or at least not health body. They both wonder whether bodily health is good if there is suffering and ignorance in the soul. Bodily health for them is merely a tool or an instrument for doing well in life. If the soul is devoid of reasoning, if it is led by love of pleasures, not only will it not know how best to make use of a healthy body, it will likely corrupt and ruin the body out of carelessness and reckless use. A sickness in the soul then brings a healthy body into a state of ruin. In order to do well and live well, Plato writes in the Protagoras through the mouth of Socrates, 
we must be concerned most with the health of that part of ourselves which uses and governs our bodies. In order to live well, Socrates suggests, we find physicians of the soul in order that we nourish that part of ourselves with good and beneficial. We're not here today to talk about philosophers. Marguerite's always reminding me that. But this contemporaneous formulation of well-being, of living well and doing well, what the philosophers called eudaimonia, may prove important to our understanding of Hippocratic practice in at least one significant way. It is clear from this language that the philosophical efforts to establish the priority of the soul and its care over the body and its care resort to the language and authority of medicine. As Democritus draws the analogy, medicine heals the sickness of the body, while wisdom rids the soul of its suffering. Scholars like Brooke Holmes have highlighted the various ways the physiological ideas of health informed ethical ideas of living well. In a flourish, we must approach and understand concepts like goodness and justice in ways similar to a physician approaching and understanding bodily health. Not only does the body become a model for the soul, but I would add that the approach of the physician to his work, that is both what Marguerite described, the care he takes to examine, record, and build a database in order to diagnose ailments and to prescribe healthy regimens, and also the care he takes to form the right relationships with patients and colleagues. Both of these become in some ways a model for philosophical inquiry and therapy. Plato's Socrates describes the ways that physicians praise and blame their patients, the ways they inspire obeisance and respect, shame and fear, and uses these to suggest by direct analogy, as well as by example, essential aspects of ethical training and investigation. The early medical texts that Plato likely had at his disposal appear only to touch on the nature of a sound physician-patient and physician-physician relationship. But later Hippocratic texts following Plato and his philosophical formulations for ethical well-being interestingly seem to respond to the philosophical models. Medicine became a model for philosophy, and this is really the big takeaway here, the second part. Medicine became a model for philosophy, and, and philosophy in turn becomes a model for medicine. The ethical project of training and becoming the right sort of person begins to influence the ways intellectuals think about training and becoming the right sort of physician. Thus, the techne or art of medicine, which consists of many of the innovations Marguerite just described, is transformed into and subordinated to a philosophical art of living, a techne to view, or as David Ruchnik puts it, a stable body of reliable knowledge able to tell us in fixed terms readily teachable to others how we ought to live. And this ethical art of living in turn gets absorbed into a more expansive Hippocratic corpus about a discourse about how we ought to practice medicine. As we shall see, though the Hippocratic corpus does not explicitly consider how the physician should care for his own soul, later ethical treatises like the Hippocratic precept and decorum develop a code of conduct and self-care that further promotes the health of patients, still the physician's primary concern. The code of conduct, this code of conduct and self-care in antiquity borrows language and concepts of philosophical traditions to provide a rich and nuanced portrait of the physician who develops virtuous capacities to improve the practice. Let's take a look at this portrait. In the often hopelessly and perhaps sometimes willfully obscure text titled On Decorum or On Seemliness or On Virtuous Behavior, we find the author clearly philosophical ground. He describes the physician who is a lover of wisdom. 
the physician, literally, who is a philosopher. And this is a handout. This is passage five of On Decorum. Medicine possesses all the qualities that make for wisdom. Freedom from avarice, shamefastness, blushing modesty, reserve, sound opinion, judgment, quiet, power to stand up against opponents, purity, righteous speech, knowledge of the things good and necessary for life, dispensing that which cleanses, freedom from superstition, prominence, divine. What they have, they have in opposition to intemperance, vulgarity, greed, concupiscence, robbery, and shamelessness. Most of these qualities taken together comprise aspects of the two cardinal virtues of sophrosyne and idols, both of which are extraordinary to render in translation precisely because ancient theorizers of these virtues made them so complex. We might translate sophrosyne as prudence or temperance or being measured and self-possessed all of which encompass qualities of shame, modesty, reserve, and quietness. In fact, a certain quietness is precisely how one of Socrates' interlocutors understands Socrates. Following the philosophers, the Hippocratic makes akolasia, or licentious and in temperance, quality to which the temperate and quiet philosopher physician is opposed. We might translate idols as reverence, or indeed also as shame with obvious overlaps with sophrosyne. Following ancient philosophers and poets, the classicist and philosopher Paul Woodruff includes in the kind of this virtue of reverence feelings of respect, shame, and awe in the right circumstances. We might observe that silence is sometimes an expression of awe and respect. As we shall see in the hands of this Hippocratic thinker, silence is often the right response to patients. Silence is also incidentally part of the right response to colleagues. I think it's also worth noting how this text elaborates with some subtlety on these virtues of reverence and self-possession by adding to a quiet strength, the portraiture of a blushing reserve. We might not wonder too much about the effects of these qualities of the philosopher position on others or even on himself. But the, pet, the text does not explain straight away why these qualities might be important to his craft. We learn that a physician's failure to guard himself closely, to be practiced in these qualities of reserve and quietness, may lead to accusations against his treatment and practice. We touched on but we also learn that being studied in the applications of cusses and bandages without being practiced in them with all reserve, as the Hippocratic says, indeed, without measured grace in the hands themselves, he says, is a deficiency, a kind of aporia that leads to helplessness and harm. Helplessness here clearly indicates the feebleness of the physician's efforts, but the harm here is general and in transit, it will become evident that there's enough harm in these instances to go around to patient, physician, colleague. It's not until the author of this ethical treatise turns to aspects of how a physician should approach and enter the room of a patient that we understand the significance of these virtues of being measured and self-possessed for both the patient and himself. It is not, I'm sorry, this is the uh, passage 12 from uh, On entering, bear in mind your manner of sitting, your reserve, your arrangement of dress. Have a decisive utterance, a brevity of speech, composure, bedside manners, care, replies to objections, calm self-control to meet the troubles that occur rebuke of disturbance, readiness to do what has to be done. The Greek here is strange, full of unusual expressions, ungrammatical formulations, 
and even words uh, that appear nowhere else in the whole of the surviving Greek corpus. But in addition to the ways the physician demonstrates his temperance with his outward appearance, that is the way he sits, dresses, holds himself, and tends to and cares for the patient inside, and demonstrates his temperance with his speech, which is decisive and brief, but responsive. We also find a physician who creates composure in others while safeguarding composure in himself. The language borrows from Epicurean philosophy and makes eustathea, stability, and ataraxia, or the freedom from anxiety and distress, essential goals in medicine. At a patient's side, the physician, physician tries to produce, in this context by means of his own body and voice, a state of tranquility in his distressed patient. As for the physician himself, the passage says, he meets any trouble, including this one before him, with his own tranquility. He is prepared for disturbances because he has cultivated tranquility in himself, together with reserve, shame, and silence. Interestingly, the Epicureans use this word for stability to describe the stable and healthy condition of the flesh. We are perhaps seeing in this instance of Hippocratic borrowing from philosophy a further innovation, a turn to greater abstraction. Epicurean stability of the flesh becomes Hippocratic stability in the self. This strange text suggests in so many words a complex typology of physician and patient interiorities and exteriorities, which Marguerite touched on. And, uh, um, in, in, in talking about the examination and understanding of physical science. The physician inside is stable and grounded, practice and ready, measured and self-possessed, reverent and still. But he also takes care to demonstrate some of these qualities in his dress and demeanor, with his voice and with his hands. He keeps watch over himself clearly in ways that are ever mindful of how he sees to others while he watches the patient and examines the signs on his body of what lies beneath. The physician tries through his craft to produce physical and mental health inside the patient, not only by diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, but also through his mindfulness that others are sensitive to signs of his self-cultivation and regard for others. It turns out the physician is acutely aware of how patients are attuned to science. In our final peculiar text for the day, the late Hippocratic work titled Precepts, an intellectual who is clearly sensitive to the effect appearances have on others, reflects on the influence of a physician's demeanor. In a gross instance of this, the precepts dissuade a physician from discussing upfront fees with patients lest such talks suggest abandonment or neglect in lieu of an agreement. The author reasons that such distress is harmful to a troubled patient, especially if the disease is acute. Only a callous and inattentive physician, if that's indeed what we should call him, would begin the extraordinarily delicate process of observing and being observed by a patient with concerns that further aggrieve his ward his con concerns should not concern his patient. The fullest expression of the effect of self-moderation and self-cultivation on the patient comes soon after when the author urges the physician against putting too much distance between himself and the patient, and rather for serving freely and in a manner that, that is seemly. This generous and seemly demeanor should be supported in the physician by calling to mind an old memory, benefaction. Again, a grace inside supports an outward grace. But why should the physician do this? Because, the author notes, some patients, though conscious that their condition is perilous, recover their health simply through their contentment with the seemliness of the physician. The warm and generous demeanor of the physician produces contentment in the patient, and that contentment has a healing effect we see that the appearance of the physician has a placebo effect. The Hippocratic text offers some ancient insight into dynamics explored in a 2017 study, which is a mere 
on the handout. The physician's social behavior moderates the effect of expectations on physiological outcomes. The Hippocratic author says in some that the physicians care for one's own the sake of seniors, sometimes aids in the recovery of health. The physician's self-care presents many outward signs of philanthropy, the Hippocratic said, which in turn produces in the patient a love, craft, and in some patients, health. The last, this is my last note. It brings together nicely our two threads today. The Hippocratic innovations described at the start, the illumination of clinical signs, the recording of a medical history, and the establishment of a database for a prognosis comprise a substantial part of the physician's craft. Without these procedures, the physician will lack crucial competencies, which may lead to certain kinds of helplessness and harm to the patient. But later Hippocratic authors note other kinds of helplessness and harm that also arise out of a lack of reserve, self-possession, and reverence. These writers cast a wide, wide net around these qualities, not only in response to a growing philosophical discourse about the art of living that appropriated and subordinated medicine, but surely also as an affirmation of what earlier Hippocratic practitioners knew all along. Competency is only one part of physician's craft. A healer must also cultivate certain kinds of inner and outer qualities. He or she must be practiced in deep and apparent virtues that taken together demonstrate a regard for self, that is sophrosine, and a regard for others, that is reverence or philanthropy. These signs of philanthropy, of a medical art of living, build trust in the medical craft and sometimes help even desperately ill patients to recover their health. Developing these virtues might also mean the flourishing of the, of the physician in other ways, but the Hippocratics leave this sort of thinking. What is clear is that the Hippocratic physician pursues his own well-being and flourishing for the sake of the well-being of patients and the flourishing of his profession. So those are our prepared remarks. And when we invite you to, um, to uh, post any questions in the Q&A, uh, while we're waiting for the comments, if, if there are, are any questions there, um, I, 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 Marguerite and I, I meet often to discuss these things. And in fact, this, um, this juxtaposition of ideas of the, the competencies and the bearing of the position. And in, in my last, my last comment, I, I said something about how the Hippocratic must have not only been responding to philosophy as an enterprise, but also just pointing out things that Hippocratics naturally would have done, would have known the ways, they would have known the ways in which the bearing and comportment had an effect on the physician. Marguerite and I talking about that, see that in the text, but also Marguerite as a, as a, a knows this quite well. So I wonder in that, if you could say, reflect on that in ways that we reflected before about the ways in which comportment, maybe some of these ideas, stillness and quiet of reserve play into a kind of patient physician interaction. Thank you. Um, I uh, suggested to James some time ago that uh, it's, necessary for the physician when he's treating the patient, when he has the role of the healer, to have a degree of detachment. And I think sometimes the detachment probably covers a lot of the other terms that James has mentioned, uh, such as quiet and calm and inner peace and so on. And I think it's a, a, a in many ways, a rather defensive mechanism on the part of the physician, mm -hmm. because what the physician is doing, basically, is taking over the responsibility of caring for someone else's body. The patient is handing over his body that he's no longer in control of to somebody else who is a physician and saying, my body isn't working. I give it to you to make better. And so 
the, the, the patient is in a very vulnerable situation where he has lost his own autonomy and has handed it to the physician. Then it gives the physician the actual moral mode of being um, responsible for this patient's life. And that's a big, big responsibility, which is why it's not something that we actually learn. Uh, people don't say to us, now, when you become a physician, you must become detached. It seems to be something that is innate, inherent, uh, that just develops because one is responsible. And it's the same, I suppose, as you could say about a mother and her baby. The, the baby is totally dependent on the mother. The mother takes the responsibility for this child's body. And it's the same also with carers for very elderly people who might be demented. Somebody else takes responsibility for the care of their body. So it's a very interesting concept to me because it's not something that we discuss very much, but it is part of human interaction uh, and a very important one. Our, that, that idea of lost autonomy um, really plays into I, ideas that the philosophers have about. It's about really understanding your place in the cosmos and understanding your obligations, not only to the things that are greater than you, but also to the things that are lesser. And it seems to me that in this interaction, what may be happening, because you say that this sort of happens in the training of physician explicitly, although the weight of it is felt, um, but the, the Hippocratic author of these texts is, is really more responding to philosophy responding to ethics. And he's saying, look, you talk all about reverence. You've got all these fancy ideas about reverence. Why don't you try being a physician for a day, right? Or, or care for someone's body where that kind of responsibility is held. And so in some ways, it's like trumping the, the, the philosopher's hand to say, we don't need to have, we can play that game too. We can talk about reverence, but we actually have to do this on a we do have a question from the audience as well. So this is coming from Nancy. I'll read it aloud. Um, hi, Nancy. Did ancient Greek and Roman physicians practice with the Hippocratic teachings and then on through the Middle Ages? That is, were they passed down and used over time or discovered in modern times? That's a great question. Well, uh, I would say probably, yes, you have to presume that these principles that are listed elucidated by people in the Hippocratic corpus, which is the period from mid fifth, mid fourth century BC, that continued. And in fact, you know, quite a lot of the writers of late antiquity, um, people, uh, Serranus and so on, um, they continued the similar sort of um, way of looking at the body and they also then had the soul involved and Hippocratics didn't worry about the soul at all. It wasn't part of their, their dictum at all. But um, what happened actually was that the Hippocratic principles sort of uh, as, uh, remained there in some form or other in, in the writings, but the writings were basically lost. Um, there were certain aspects of the Hippocratic corpus that, that survived in the eastern part of the Roman Empire and then were taken up by the Arabs and transported back through Spain and eventually in the 12th century started to uh, be, be sort of made more public than they had been. Uh, um, and it wasn't really until uh, there was publications uh, when, when the printed word came out in the 16th century that the Hippocratic writings became available to scholars. And it wasn't until the 19th century that people really started looking at the Hippocratic corpus. So it's had a bit of a checkered career, the Hippocratic corpus. It hasn't always been there to, just, to um, let people know what how they should behave, what they should think, etc. 
but um, it, it's still got basic principles about human interaction that are as true today as they were two and a half thousand years ago. Marguerite has been doing a lot of work, uh, the devil work, to try and sort out how much of the, the patina of um, figures like Galen uh, and, and the philosophers, and the learned, the learned uh, uh, scholars who think about the body and, and what ails it, um, how much of that can be uh, scraped away right, to, to reveal something more fundamental. And that's why she's turned primarily to the fifth century text that her by most, most agree to be the earliest. And in some ways, given the narrative that I shared, the most uncontaminated when it comes to um, the influence of philosophy and thinking about pre-Christian um, and early Christian influence. Something else that I was a little curious about is whether any of this education is included in the curriculum for medical students. Um, or whether this is really something that you two completely sought out um, on your own. And yeah, how, how included it is for people who are studying to be physicians. I, I don't know. Uh, I know that in my uh, early student days, it wasn't something that was on the, uh, on the curriculum. Whether it is now, I'm not sure. Certainly in Australia, we don't take the Hippocratic Oath, and I do believe that there are quite a lot of uh, medical schools in the United States that do, not particularly as it was written, but in some other form. So um, maybe, I think probably every country is different um, about how it approaches this sort of thing, but basically um, everybody, uh, who knows anything about the history of medicine uh, in the medical field will know the name Hippocrates as the father of medicine, and 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 the and they they all presume that he wrote the oath, uh, and that's about as far as it goes. I mean, it's very limited the knowledge of the medical profession about these things. And so, in, in my retirement, as I said earlier, it's just been a lovely opportunity for me to delve into it and find some, perhaps find some answers. Well, I, mean, I think uh, what we're learning as we, as we I look at the Helen King book and mm -hmm. some recent scholarship and, and actual curriculum design, that there is more of an effort, I think, to, to engage students uh, in, in medical school and other um, health professions um, around how to cultivate, uh, how to, and narrativize how to think about um, one's demeanor in the health profession, right? How to engage with people, how to model certain kinds of engagement. And certainly one of the things that we do, I mean, that is not what this, this conference today is really all about in many ways, right? Is to reflect on these things. So you can see a growing discourse um, that started quite softly um, decade or so ago, but it's becoming more, much more mainstream and, and both out of, um, I think, an effort to understand um, the roots of disciplines, but more fundamentally to actually um, to help physicians do their jobs better, right? to help physicians um, feel, feel the right ways, to have the right capacities to, to, to actually do, do these different have these different kinds of exchange. So it's not, dis it's not discussed enough is probably what, what I would say about medical courses, medical curricula, um, the, the, the state of the emotions in the mind of a student or recent graduate uh, I never ever talked about. Uh, just you I just suppose to be big enough to get on with it, you know. <laughs> That's definitely that's a, a sign of your of your generation and all that difficult training you went through. I know some some discussions with um, some first and second year medical students in Southern California, um, and talking about uh, burnout rates within the uh, you know the sort of medical professions, 
and that there is, you know, I, you can only imagine what, the, what, what um, discussions about things like self composure, about quietness, about being grounded in oneself, all the things that this strange text draws attention to. You can imagine what, where, what, where are we? <laughs> what are we to hear that in your first and second year of medical school? But how great to actually start a discussion. Of this. And if anyone's curious about about um, how applicable some of these ancient ideas are, on the suggested readings, the handout, a little um, powerful book by um, by Paul Williams, Reverence, uh, Renewing a Forgotten Virtue. There's a lot in there that touches on some of these notions, but so much more. Um, so I encourage um, I encourage you if you're curious to. Uh, we have our email addresses at the bottom of the handout. So if you have uh, any questions or thoughts, um, we we love to just shoot us an email. Be quick to respond. Thank okay. you, Ariana. Thanks to yeah, of course. thanks to the whole to the whole crew there for pulling this off. Congratulations.